This is potentially the craziest video that I've posted on this channel. One of these players broke their neck in four places and somehow made a return to basketball and another just got sentenced to 30 months in prison. You're not going to want to miss this. This is what happened to the top 10 picks of the 2000 NBA draft. Coming into the 2000 NBA draft, Kenyon Martin was coming off of an incredible senior season at the University of Cincinnati, where he would be named as the 1999-2000 Player of the Year, averaging 18.9 points, 9.7 rebounds, 1.4 assists, 1.4 steals, and 3.5 blocks per game. It was very difficult for scouts not to be in love with his game, with NBADraft.net giving him a prospect score of 106 out of 120. Scouting teams around the league were head over heels for his athletic ability, play above the rim, shot blocking ability, his ability to control the boards on both sides of the ball, and his clutch gene. However, there were definitely some doubts if he would be able to dominate the paint the same way that he could in college due to his 6'9 height at the powered forward position and the lack of upper body strength that he had at the time. While this is more than an ideal size for a power forward in today's game, back in 2000, it was still not out of the ordinary for teams to build twin tower type lineups. Along with this, some speculated that this would culminate in him suffering through constant injuries once he was actually in the NBA. Many compared his game to Rashid Wallace and as expected, the New Jersey Nets used the first overall pick to add Martin to their roster. When asked about his draft night experience years after his retirement, Martin was quoted as saying, People ask me about my career and my highs and lows, the happiest moment of my career was just getting drafted. Just getting drafted, period. My draft picture. That's the only picture I got hanging up in my house right now. It meant so much and I'm crying shaking David Stern's hand. Martin would have a very successful rookie season, proving that he was more than capable of holding his own in the paint at the professional level, leading the Nets in blocks per game with 1.7. He was named to the all-rookie first team, however, without much elite talent on the team, New Jersey would struggle their way to a 26-56 record. In the offseason, they would make a crucial addition to the team in Jason Kidd, one of the best playmakers that the game had ever seen. The Nets would have an incredible turnaround season, more than doubling their 26 wins from the previous year and ending their 2000-2001 campaign with a record of 52-30. Despite only being in his second season, Martin would lead the team in points and blocks per game with 14.9 and 1.7 respectively. New Jersey would go on a deep playoff run this year, beating the Indiana Pacers in the first round in five games, the Charlotte Hornets in the second round in five games, the Boston Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals in six games, but then they would have the misfortune of running into the Shaq and Kobe-led Los Angeles Lakers in the NBA Finals. While Martin had proven that he would function well in the paint at the NBA level, trying to score on and slow down a force like Shaquille O'Neal is an entirely different beast. The Nets would fall in just four games, however, this would still be one of the most impressive single season turnarounds in recent history. After the masterclass that Shaq put on in those NBA Finals, New Jersey would pick up Dikembe Mutombo in the following offseason to help aid Martin against much larger opponents in the paint. While Matumbo would go on to lead the team in blocks this season, Martin would dominate the boards, leading the team with 8.3 per game. Once again, the Nets were poised for a deep playoff run, and they took care of business beating the Milwaukee Bucks in six games in the first round. They then proceeded to sweep the Boston Celtics and Detroit Pistons to get to their second consecutive NBA Finals. This time, they would take on the San Antonio Spurs. While New Jersey fared better in this series, they still would fall short of a title, losing the series in six games. Over the offseason, minor adjustments will be made to the roster, the biggest being replacing Matumbo with Alonzo Mourning, another legendary center with a traditional skill set for the position. This would go on to be the best individual season of Martin's career, with him making his first and only All-Star appearance. He once again led the Nets in rebounds and blocks per game with 9.5 and 1.3 respectively. While the Nets were able to make the previous two NBA Finals, they were stopped short in the second round by the eventual champion Detroit Pistons in seven games. After a disappointing postseason for New Jersey, they felt as if a trade was necessary and dealt Martin to the Denver Nuggets. In a sign-in trade, New Jersey would acquire three first-round picks and Martin would go on to join a very solid Denver Nuggets team built around a budding star in Carmelo Anthony. While Martin did not lead Denver in any statistical category in his first year with the team, he would play an incredible second fiddle to Anthony. However, with the Western Conference being absolutely loaded around this time, 
they would fall in the first round to the San Antonio Spurs, just five games. The 2005 to 2006 season, Martin would miss a substantial chunk of the season due to an injury, only playing 56 games. And the Nuggets once again fell in the first round in five games, this time to the Los Angeles Clippers. Martin would only be able to participate in two games in the following season due to injuries. However, when he made his return in the 2007 to 2008 season, he would regain his position as a full-time starter. He would continue being the starting power forward for his remaining time in Denver. However, the team would not be able to achieve much in the postseason and injuries would increasingly begin to take their toll on Martin. After the 2010-11 season, Denver would go into rebuilding mode and Martin would walk to free agency where he signed with the Los Angeles Clippers. This would be the first time in his career that he strictly came off the bench, serving as a backup and mentor to Blake Griffin. Despite the handful of injuries that he suffered at this point in his career, he was still a very effective rebounder and rim protector, but the Clippers would still fall in the second round of the playoffs. After his one year run with the Clippers, he would reunite with Carmelo Anthony, this time on the New York Knicks, where he spent the next two seasons. He would then fluctuate between starter and bench player on the Knicks in the limited time that he was able to take the court. Over those two seasons with the Knicks, he would only play in 50 games. His final year in the league would come in the 2014-15 season, where he would only play in 11 games with the Milwaukee Bucks. And after his NBA career had ended, Martin joined Ice Cube's Big 3 Basketball League, and he helped lead the trilogy to an undefeated season in 2017, and later became the team's head coach. Now he gets to kick back, relax, and watch his son, Kenyon Martin Jr., play for the Philadelphia 76ers. Despite being the second overall pick in the 2000 draft, most NBA fans have forgotten about our next player completely. Despite struggling at the professional level, Stromile Swift was a highly touted prospect coming to the 2000 NBA draft. In his final year at LSU, he was named as the SEC Player of the Year. Scouts were in love with his jumping ability, and he turned heads when he jumped from the free throw line as a high schooler. However, he was looked at as a raw talent type of guy that would have to be carefully developed if he were to become a top talent in the league. NBADraft.net gave him a prospect score of 99 out of 120, and many scouts compared him to Sean Kemp. The Vancouver Grizzlies would use their second overall pick to add him to their already well-rounded roster that included Sharif Abdur-Rahim and Mike Bibby. But concerning signs would begin to show themselves in his rookie season as he was only able to start in 6 out of 80 games that he played in. Despite almost all of his shots coming inside the 3 point line, Swift still shot a less than ideal 45.1% from the field and averaged 4.9 points per game. Despite his struggles in regulation games, he was still turning heads as a dunker and he would actually go on to compete in the 2001 slam dunk contest. The 2001-2002 season would be the best of his career, however, he would still struggle to break into the starting lineup, only serving as a starter in 20.5% of the games that he played in. Despite this, he would still rank 5th on the Grizzlies in points and 2nd in blocks with 11.8 and 1.7 per game respectively. While Swift would not show much growth into his final two years with the Grizzlies, the team would begin to develop into playoff contenders, making postseason appearances in both the 2003-2004 and 2004-2005 seasons. But they would be swept in the first round both times by the San Antonio Spurs in 2004 and by the Phoenix Suns in 2005. The 2004-2005 season would be the final time in Swift's career that he was able to average double-digit points per game. In the offseason following the 2004-2005 season, Swift would sign with the Houston Rockets, where he would play a very similar role. After just one season with Houston, they would trade him and Rudy Gay back to the Grizzlies for Shane Battier. In the 2006-2007 season, Swift would once again struggle to gain the attention of the coaching staff, and it was very clear that he didn't have what it took to become an elite NBA talent like many had hoped. Midway through the following season, Memphis would trade him to the New Jersey Nets for Jason Collins and cash considerations. After a short-lived stint with the Nets, where he would only play in 27 games, he would be waived from the team. Despite this, he would quickly be signed by the Phoenix Suns, however, after only averaging 3.0 points and 2.5 rebounds in the 2008-2009 season, he would be forced to begin his career overseas with the Shangdong Lions. Nowadays, Swift coaches high school basketball at Word of God Academy in Louisiana and led them to two ACEL state championships in a row. Although the next player on our list would prove himself as a skilled inside scorer, his career would be cut unexpectedly short due to injuries. 
Darius Miles entered the NBA straight from high school and showed loads of potential through his short time in the league. Coming into the draft, NBADraft.net gave him a prospect score of 98 out of 120. Scouts were very high on his athletic ability, how he ran the floor, and his handle. However, with him coming from high school, there were obvious concerns on if his body would be able to keep up with grown men. Along with this, he did not have much of an outside shot coming into the league, but he was still drawing comparisons to Hall of Fame caliber players such as Tracy McGrady. The Los Angeles Clippers would select him with the third overall pick, buying into this tremendous upside that he presented. An interesting pick as they already featured solid wing options like Corey Maggette, Lamar Odom, and Quentin Richardson. Due to those players already being at the wing, Miles would only start in a combined 27 out of 163 games that he played in Los Angeles. Over that time, he proved himself as a very solid inside scorer, rebounder, and interior defender, and even made the all-rookie first team. However, he lacked any sort of outside shot. In an attempt to trade their wing depth for some help at the point guard position, Miles and Harold Jameson would be traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers for Andre Miller and Bryant Stiff. Beginning in the 2002-2003 season with the Cavaliers, Miles would play almost every game as the team's starting small forward. Despite being given a bigger role, Miles would still struggle to find his shot, finishing the season shooting 41% from the field and missing every three-point attempt that he took. In the following offseason, Cleveland would draft LeBron James, causing Miles once again to struggle to find a role that he fit well into. As a result of this, Cleveland would trade him to the Portland Trailblazers for Jeff McInnes and Ruben Boomshay Boomshay. Miles would start in 40 out of 42 games that he played in for the Trailblazers in the 2003-2004 season and was playing some of the best basketball of his career up to that point. Despite continuing this hot streak into the 2004-2005 season, he would make headlines for an altercation with the team's head coach, Maurice Cheeks, in a film session. Things got so bad that Miles was suspended for two games for conduct that was detrimental to the team, and Cheeks considered quitting afterwards. Miles would go on to release a statement saying, Things were said in frustration and I'm sorry for that. It is very important to me that our fans understand that I am committed to winning and that losses we have had this season have been difficult for all of us. My entire focus when I return to the team will be on winning and helping us make a run for the playoffs. Despite this incident, the Trailblazers would keep Miles on their roster for the remainder of the season and through the 2005 to 2006 season as well. The 2005-2006 season would be statistically the best of his entire career, averaging 14.0 points per game, second on the team only behind Zach Randolph. However, tragedy would strike and Miles would suffer a knee injury that would severely limit his production in the 2005-2006 campaign, along with keeping him sidelined for the next two seasons as well. Sadly, Miles would never be the same player after this injury and would only play one more season in the league. He joined the Memphis Grizzlies, but he was forced to serve a 10-game suspension for violating the league's substance abuse policy. He played strictly a bench role for the Grizzlies, and it was clear that he was no longer an NBA caliber player. His game heavily relied on his athleticism, and with a knee injury so serious, there was not much he could really contribute at the time. After averaging 3.5 points per game with Memphis, he was forced into retirement at only 27 years old. In a Reddit Ask Me Anything he hosted, when asked what he thought of the duo of him and Zach Randolph, what they could have been, Miles was quoted as saying, I definitely think me and Zebo could have been a dominant duo. I was ready to take the next step of my career in Portland. I felt like my skill level and knowledge of the game was right there to be a number one or two option on a team. I had seven coaches in nine years, so it was hard to get rhythm, but I don't dwell on what ifs. Just take the cards that's dealt to me. The 42-year-old Miles is now worth about $100,000 according to Celebrity Net Worth. His $61 million salary from the NBA was nearly all gone at the age of 34, and he filed for bankruptcy in 2016. Nowadays, he hosts a podcast with former teammate Quinton Richardson called The Knuckleheads, where they interview top players in the league. The fourth overall pick in this draft class would also tragically have their career cut short due to injuries. Heading into the 2000 NBA Draft, Marcus Pfizer was coming off a big junior season at Iowa State where he was named as the Big 12 Player of the Year. Scouts saw him as having an NBA-ready body, an inside-out scorer, and had quite the handle for a power forward in this era. But he was a bit slow for his size and some were worried that he would be too short to play power forward at the NBA level. Despite this, he still drew comparisons to players like Charles Barkley. 
The Chicago Bulls snatched him up with the fourth overall pick, but this would likely end up being a pick that they wish they could have had back. In his rookie season, while averaging a solid enough stat line of 9.5 points and 4.3 rebounds per game, he would struggle to score efficiently, shooting 43% from the field. However, he would still earn a spot on the all-rookie team and worked his way into the starting lineup in 13 out of 72 games that he played in. Looking to make a big jump in his second season, Pfizer had the best statistical season of his short career. He ranked 5th on the team in points per game and 3rd in rebounds per game with 12.3 and 5.6 respectively. While he was still struggling to score in an efficient clip, it still appeared that Pfizer was taking steps in the right direction. He was playing at a very similar level early on in the 2002-2003 season, but after a devastating ACL tear that took place at the end of January, he would never be the same player again. He finished out his contract with Chicago in the 2003-2004 season, only managing to start in 2 out of 46 games that he played in. It was clear that there was still some work to do for him to ever get back to the previous level that he was playing at. After the season, he would sign a one-year deal with the Milwaukee Bucks after failing to make the final roster of the newly added Charlotte Hornets after being drafted by the team in the expansion draft. Pfizer would strictly play a bench role with the Bucks and would have one of the most efficient scoring seasons of his career. But with him still falling very short of the promise that he had coming into the league, the Bucks front office believed the roster spot would better be served with a different player. As a result of this, Pfizer would once again hit the free agency market without many suitors. He was forced to spend most of the season in the D-League, but after winning the league's MVP, he would earn a 10-day contract with the New Orleans Hornets. Over those 10 days, he would play in three games, and although he shot 52.9% from the field, 100% from three, and averaged more points per game than he did with the Bucks, this would be his final stint in the NBA. When talking about his time in the league in a 2013 interview, he was quoted as saying, My thing is, my career was derailed by injuries. It's probably my fault, because I wasn't training the way I should have. But I've had three ACL surgeries. To be playing right now is definitely a blessing. When you're playing at any high level after that, it's just a blessing. But you see guys who are former lottery picks, who have played most of their careers and then turned out not to have done anything. I think it's unfair because of the injuries I've had to deal with. Like I said, I'll take the blame because I didn't train the way I should have, but now I get it. After basketball, Pfizer dabbled in being a youth pastor for some time before ultimately becoming the CEO of Slip Guardians, which is a company that treats floors to be slip resistant. While this next player was not one of the three in the draft class to make an all-star game, it could still be argued that he had one of the best careers out of any player in the 2000 NBA draft class. Mike Miller entered the 2000 NBA draft coming off of an all-SEC season in his final year with the Florida Gators. He was looked at as a player who could do it all. Scouts made sure to point out his elite ball handling skills, especially for a player that is 6'8". As we know, the strongest part of his game is his lights out shooting from beyond the arc though. Outside of him being a bit lacking as an athlete, scouts really didn't have to say much about his weaknesses in his game. The Orlando Magic picked him up with the 5th overall pick, and Miller would prove that he was ready to make the adjustment to the NBA early in his rookie season. He started in all but 20 games and proved scouts right about his outside shot, converting 40.7% of his 3-point attempts. He would take home the Rookie of the Year award and play a major role in the Orlando Magic making a trip to the playoffs where they would sadly be eliminated by the Milwaukee Bucks in four games. While Miller would still not take over as a full-time starter despite being the reigning Rookie of the Year, this was not a result of him playing poorly. Magic had a plethora of wing talent at the time, including Tracy McGrady and Grant Hill. Miller would finish his second season in the league as the third highest scorer on the team with 15.2 points per game, finishing only behind the two previously mentioned players. Once again, Orlando would be bounced in the first round of the playoffs, this time by the Charlotte Hornets. Midway through the 2002-2003 season, Miller, Ryan Humphrey, a 2003 first round pick, and a 2004 second round pick would be sent to the Memphis Grizzlies for Gordon Giracek, Drew Gooden, and cash considerations. He would play a reduced role with Memphis, leading to his per game stats to take a bit of a hit. However, he was still scoring at a ridiculously efficient clip. In the 16 games that he played for Memphis, he shot 51% from the field and 50% from three. However, he and the Grizzlies would miss the playoffs. Following season, Miller would serve as a full-time starter for the first time in his career. He served as an elite spot-up shooter, one of the league's best marksmen. 
In the postseason, Miller would once again suffer a first round defeat, being swept by the San Antonio Spurs. In the 2004-2005 season, Miller would bounce from starter to bench player throughout the year, excelling in both of those roles. It would be his best scoring season since the year he was traded to the Grizzlies. Although Memphis made a return to the playoffs, the roster didn't have what it took to keep up with some of the top teams in the league, and they would be swept in the first round, this time by the Phoenix Suns. The following year, Miller would thrive coming off the bench. Despite only starting in 9 games throughout the season, Miller would still see improvements to his scoring and rebounding numbers. This earned him the honor of being the league's 6th man of the year. But in the playoffs, he would once again be sent home in embarrassing fashion, being swept in the first round, this time by the Dallas Mavericks. It seems like everybody is just taking their turns, you know, sweeping Mike Miller in the playoffs. You gotta feel bad for the guy. This would be the final time that he was a part of a playoff team until the 2010-11 season. Leading up to this, he played one final season with the Grizzlies before being a part of a draft day trade that sent him, Brian Cardinal, Jason Collins, and Kevin Love to the Minnesota Timberwolves, while the Grizzlies received Marco Jaric, Antoine Walker, Greg Buckner, and OJ Mayo. But after just one season in Minnesota, Miller would be on the move again, this time landing with the Washington Wizards. This deal sent the 5th overall pick in the 2009 draft, Alexei Petrov, Eton Thomas, and Darius Songalia to the Timberwolves while Randy Foy and Miller would join the Wizards. This would be another one-year pit stop that culminated in missing the postseason. After being sick of not seeing the playoffs, Miller would join LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh in signing with the Miami Heat in the 2010 offseason. Miller was the perfect addition to this big three as the stars all struggled with outside shooting, which likely would have led to a detrimental lack of floor spacing. He would come off the bench as James and Wade would take up the starting wing spots. Despite Miller's scoring numbers being nearly cut in half from just the season before in Washington, it was clear that he was more than willing to sacrifice individual stats for the team's success. Miller would make it out of the first round for the first time in his career as the Heat would make it to the NBA Finals where they were unfortunately shocked by the Dallas Mavericks and sent home in six games. But they would be back in the finals the following season, this time taking on the Oklahoma City Thunder. And the veteran Heat team would prove to be too much for the Thunder, and they would win this series in just five games, giving Miller the first ring of his entire career. In the 2012-13 season, he would add another ring to his resume, this time taking down the San Antonio Spurs in a hard-fought seven-game series. Shockingly, Miami would waive him from the team after this season, and he would make his return to the Memphis Grizzlies. Miller played a larger role in Memphis, leading to him seeing a spike in points per game. Memphis would make the postseason, however, they ran into an elite Oklahoma City Thunder team that they would fall to in seven games. In the offseason, he would run it back with LeBron, this time in Cleveland. With Miller being 34 years old at the time, he was far from being the contributor that he once was, but he was still an elite shooter. He would only average 7.3 minutes per game in the finals, and they would be taken down by the Golden State Warriors in six games. He would then spend the final two years of his career with the young Denver Nuggets team where he would mainly serve as a mentor. And as of February 2023, Miller is a basketball agent for LIFT Sports Management, a company that he founded alongside Donnie McGrath, who is a former Providence College basketball player. They are an athlete representation service that works with highly skilled prospects. Up next is a player from this draft class who had their career majorly altered due to an injury. Damar Johnson would share the floor with Kenyon Martin at the University of Cincinnati where he would be named as an all-conference player. Scouts were very interested in his athletic ability and his elite deep ball along with his versatility that allowed him to play the point guard, shooting guard, or small forward positions. However, with him being only one year removed from high school, there were some serious concerns about him being shoved into the NBA. Despite this, he was still drawing comparisons to Scottie Pippen, leading to him being selected with the 6th overall pick by the Atlanta Hawks. In his first two years in the league, he would struggle scoring around the basket due to his slim frame. Despite this, he did show a lot of promise with his outside shot, shooting 36% from 3 in his second season. However, this season would be cut short and Johnson would also miss the entirety of the 2002-2003 season due to suffering a broken neck that came as a result of a car he was in crashing into a tree and it ultimately caught on fire. This was a brutal wreck that caused Johnson to crack four vertebrae in his neck and he was nearly paralyzed. 
While it was a miracle that he could even make a return to the NBA, this injury would bring his development to a complete halt and led to Johnson never breaking double digits in per game scoring. He would receive his second chance with the New York Knicks where he spent one season, playing 21 games and even starting in one. This would also be his first trip to the playoffs, however, it would be short-lived as the Knicks were swept in the first round by the New Jersey Nets. He would spend the next three seasons with the Denver Nuggets playing a very similar role. Johnson and the Nuggets would make the playoffs in all three of his years with the team, every time being defeated in five games in the first round. The first defeat came in the 2004-2005 season at the hands of the San Antonio Spurs, second losing to the Los Angeles Clippers, and the last season to the San Antonio Spurs once again, where he did not play. Johnson would spend the final season of his NBA career with the San Antonio Spurs, where he would only play in five games, sadly being forced into retirement at only 27 years of age. As of January 2023, Johnson was selected to be the assistant coach of the West Virginia men's basketball team. They would make the NCAA tourney last year, but they were eliminated by Maryland in the first round. Hopefully, they make a deeper run this season. Shockingly, the seventh overall pick would also have their career impacted due to a string of injuries. Chris Mim entered the 2000 NBA draft after consecutive nods as an all-conference player. He was a skilled seven-footer who could not be stopped in the paint and moved especially well for his size. There were definitely some doubts about his lateral quickness and if he was effective enough in big moments. However, scouts were still comparing him to Brad Doherty. Despite being picked seventh overall by the Chicago Bulls, he would be traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers for Jamal Crawford and cash considerations. Mim would serve as a serviceable starting big man for the Cavs in his rookie year, but he had his season cut short due to injuries. Despite this, he would still earn an appearance on the all-rookie team, and he would remain on the Cavs throughout the 2003-2004 season before the team would trade him midway through the 2004-2005 season after not showing much development. He would be part of a deal that sent him, Ricky Davis, and Michael Stewart to the Boston Celtics for Eric Williams, Tony Battee, and Kendrick Brown. A change of scenery did not do much for Mim though, and his numbers were very comparable to those that he put up in Cleveland. He would make his first postseason appearance this season, but he and the Celtics were swept in the first round by the Indiana Pacers. In the offseason, Mim would once again be traded, this time to the Los Angeles Lakers. The deal sent Mim, Chucky Atkins, and Marcus Banks to the Lakers, and in return, Gary Payton and Rick Fox landed in Boston. He played a much larger role with the Lakers and saw a spike in his scoring numbers, culminating in him scoring 10.2 points per game in the 2005-2006 season, which would be the only time in his career that he would crack double digits. However, he would have his season cut short due to an ankle injury that would keep him sidelined for the entirety of the 2006-2007 season. Mim would lose the mobility that made him such a promising prospect and he would never be the same player following his injury. In his final two years in the league spent with the Lakers, he would quickly be given a bench roll and rarely saw the floor, clocking nearly three minutes in the playoffs in the season of his return, and played in just 41 games in his final two seasons in the league. After giving up basketball, Mim returned to his university to complete his studies in 2012 and graduated with a degree in psychology and a minor in communications. Now it's time to break down the career of the player that Mim got traded for on draft night. Despite not receiving any accolades in his sole season at the University of Michigan, Jamal Crawford's talent was undeniable. He had a generational handle and was the pure definition of a hooper, even in college. However, some scouts still believed that he had to develop both mentally and physically and that he needed to get better defensively. Despite this, he still drew comparisons to players like Ron Harper. As previously mentioned, he was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers but was traded to the Chicago Bulls on draft day. He got off to a slow start in the league, shooting only 35.2% from the field in his rookie season and having his second season cut short due to injuries. With this part of his career out of the way, in the next season he would break through as an essential part of the offense, breaking the double digit points per game threshold with 10.7. In the 2003-2004 season, his final with Chicago, Crawford would prove to be a lethal offensive weapon averaging 17.3 points and 5.1 assists per game, while being almost a full-time starter for the Bulls. After this season, he would be traded along with Jerome Williams to the New York Knicks and in return the Bulls received Othella Harrington, Dikemi Mutombo, Cesare Trebonski, and Frank Williams. Crawford fit in extremely well with this young roster and he was able to continue flourishing as a starter. 
His scoring numbers would take a slight hit in his second season with the team as head coach Larry Brown made the career-altering decision of giving Crawford a sixth-man role. But eventually, he would go back to being a starter in the 2007-2008 season, where he started in all 80 games that he played in. This caused him to average 20.6 points and 5.0 assists per game, the most points per game that he would average throughout his career. Midway through the 2008-2009 season, Crawford would be part of a three-team trade. Crawford was sent to the Golden State Warriors, Zach Randolph and Marty Collins were sent to the Los Angeles Clippers, and in return the Knicks received Al Harrington, Tim Thomas, and Coutinho Mobley. He would start for the Warriors for the remainder of the year, keeping near identical averages to what he was putting up in New York that season. However, over the offseason, he would be dealt yet again, this time to the Atlanta Hawks. The deal sent Crawford to Atlanta, and in return, the Warriors would receive A.C. Law and Speedy Claxton. From this point on, Crawford would serve as a permanent sixth man unless injuries led to him being forced to start. He would provide the Hawks with an elite scoring option off the bench, and it would propel them to a playoff run. He would go on to win his first Sixth Man of the Year award in this season as well. Along with this, this season would be the first time in his career that Crawford saw the postseason, but it would be a short-lived run with the Orlando Magic sweeping them in the second round. The following season, the Hawks would see more success in the postseason, getting their revenge on the Orlando Magic in the first round, winning the series in six games, then falling in the second round in six games to the Chicago Bulls. In the following offseason, he signed with the Portland Trailblazers, and he led the league in free throw percentage at an elite 92.7%. However, this was the most notable thing to come from this season as the Blazers would fail to make the postseason. In the following offseason, he would sign with the Los Angeles Clippers, where he would go on to have the most successful run of his career. Despite having a talented roster over this five-year run that included players such as Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan, and Lou Williams, along with Crawford, they would fail to ever make it past the second round of the playoffs. Along with this, he would establish himself as arguably the greatest sixth man of all time as he won the award two additional times in 2014 and 2016. After being waived from the Clippers in the 2017 offseason, he would sign with the Minnesota Timberwolves where he played a very similar role as he did in Los Angeles. This season would also mark Crawford's final trip to the playoffs where he and the Timberwolves were eliminated in the first round in five games by the Houston Rockets. In the 2018 offseason, he would sign with a young and rebuilding Phoenix Suns team on a veteran minimum contract. While not much winning came from this season, Crawford would make history as the oldest player to score 50 points in a game and the most points in history by a sixth man with his 51 point scoring outburst against the Dallas Mavericks. Despite this historic feat, he would just play in one more NBA game for the Brooklyn Nets after signing with the team in the 2019 offseason. As of 2022, Crawford has been featured as an NBA analyst across TNT, NBA TV, and various social media platforms. While the ninth pick in the 2000 NBA draft would go on to spend over a decade in the league, he would struggle to make a huge impact for the most part of his career. Despite not earning any prestigious awards in college, Joel Prisbilla had the ideal size and build of a traditional center around this time. However, he truly is a testament of how low the bar was set for centers in the 2000s. Scouts were certain that he would translate well as a shot blocker and a rebounder as a result of his 7 foot 1, 260 pound frame, but they were skeptical about what he could do outside of this. He drew comparisons to Luke Longley, and the Houston Rockets selected him with the ninth overall pick. But later on in the draft, he would be traded to the Milwaukee Bucks for Jason Collier and a first round pick. Scouts really knocked it out of the park as Prisbilla greatly struggled as a scorer, averaging only 0.8 points per game, but he did well as a rebounder and a shot blocker. He would continue to see a diminished role with the Bucks throughout his first three years before they traded him early into his fourth season with the team. Three-team deal landed him with the Hawks, where he would finish out the season before being dealt yet again, this time to the Portland Trailblazers. In his first season with Portland, he set a career high in points per game with 6.4, and the following season would mark his career high in blocks with 2.3 per game. However, he would start to show signs of regression through the tail end of his eight-year stint with Portland. Midway through the 2010-11 season, he would be traded to the Charlotte Bobcats for Gerald Wallace. This was a controversial trade, as it was a clear sign that the Bobcats were tanking for a chance at a lottery pick. After one year in Charlotte, Prisbilla would return to Portland where he played in 27 games and started in 19. 
the 2012 to 13 season he would make yet another return this time coming back to the bucks where he would play his final 12 games of his career he now resides in wisconsin and enjoys hunting and fishing in his free time along with raising livestock and growing crops rounding out the top 10 picks of the 2000 nba draft is a point guard who went on to be a solid bench player for a handful of teams but recently found himself in trouble Keon Dooling was coming off of an all-conference nod in his first year at Missouri. In college, Dooling was a one-man show on offense. He could poster almost anybody on the floor and had an incredible outside shot. But some were worried about how he would perform at the point guard position in the NBA as he struggled passing the ball as he was viewed as more of a pure scorer, earning him a fair share of Steve Francis comparisons. He was selected 10th overall by the Orlando Magic but was traded to the Los Angeles Clippers along with Corey Maggette, Derek Strong, and cash considerations for a future first round pick on draft day. Dueling would get off to an extremely slow start in the league, starting in only two games in his first three years of the league. However, in his fourth season with the Clippers, he would start in 24 out of 58 games that he played in. Despite this, his scoring numbers remained similar to when he was coming off of the bench, averaging around six points per game. When he was given the chance in the 2003 to 2004 season, he shot an abysmal 38.9% from the field and 17.4% from three. After this season, Dueling would sign with the Miami Heat where he served as a bench player. His numbers would plummet from the previous season in Los Angeles, however, he received another chance in the following offseason with the Orlando Magic. But once again, he would struggle to recapture the offensive prowess that he possessed in college. In the 2008 offseason, he was traded to the New Jersey Nets where he would spend the next two years. In his first season in New Jersey, he set a career high in points at 9.7 per game he was beginning to round out his game a little bit more and become more of a passer like scouts wanted to see from him coming out of college. Despite this, the Nets would let him walk in free agency and he would sign to the Milwaukee Bucks the 2010-11 season. He would crack 3 assists per game for just the second time in his career this season with Milwaukee, but it would not be enough for the team to re-sign him and he joined the Boston Celtics in the following season. With Dueling now in his early 30s, he would begin to play less and less, only seeing the floor in 46 games as a Celtic before signing with the Memphis Grizzlies in what would be his final season. In the 2012-13 season, Dueling played in just 7 games, but over that stretch he had the best field goal percentage and second best 3 point percentage of his entire career. While this would only culminate in 4.4 points per game, it proved that if he was drafted to a team that could have developed him the right way, there is a chance that he could have been a solid talent in the NBA. As of February 2023 though, Keon Dooling was sentenced to prison for his role in defrauding the NBA's health and welfare plan. He was sentenced to 30 months in prison per an announcement from the US Attorney's Office. And I'm sure that's not quite the life that he must have imagined after being in the NBA. Now, if you guys did enjoy this video today, make sure that you guys do me a solid and hit that subscribe button. Also, if you want to check out some more content, I have plenty of it. I will catch you guys in the next one.